Mario, it's an absolute pleasure to have you back on the Experts Blueprint today. Um, I've looked forward to our catch-up episode and it's happened a little bit quicker uh, due to what's what's going on in the Ukraine situation. Um, for listeners who don't know, you were a combatant in the Yugoslavian Civil War, 1,800 consecutive days of battle um, in, in a war in the Eastern European continent at the time. Um, so you understand firsthand what a war over there looks like. Um, but first of all, Mario, thanks for thanks for coming on. Tim, thank you for for having me here uh, today on your podcast uh, Blueprint um, for success. It is a truly a pleasure, Tim. Look, I, when I'm when I'm seeing what's happening in Ukraine, um, I'm seeing equally same uh, situation what's happening in Yugoslavia. The only difference it is that when we fought for the uh, for our independence and freedom, we faced third most powerful third most powerful uh, military um, in Europe, which was the Yugoslav People Army, and um, that army, just to put it in context, that army was not just uh, uh, volunteers and conscripts. That army was uh, one of the biggest exporters of the weapons. To the Middle East countries, and they build a lot of facilities across the globe, and it was always being prepared for the war against uh, uh, Russia and as well against the West. Now, suddenly, when we went in a war without seeing now in Ukraine, the only difference it is that a part of us being invaded by the by the Yugoslav People Army from outside. Uh, from let's just say uh, they will go by some axis, which was a regular army. We have the paramilitary units, which they are doing a lot of dirty work uh, in assisting federal army, Yugoslav People Army. Plus, Yugoslav People Army had established army barracks within cities, which they usually usually be in position next to the hospitals and uh, between the schools. So in that way, they will. In case of the war, we always been told just we paint the red cro- red cross uh, on on a, on the roof, and you know will not be bombed. Because the people are inside the city, paramilitary around the city, and federal uh, people army and their corps advancing on uh, several axes across the country. Ukrainians, I must say, they are very brave because they're facing as we did very powerful military we can talk as much as we want i'm not talking about strategies and i don't want to talk about military plans because that's not my job i'm not qualified to talk about this and never will um, but what i can say when you're fighting war like in ukraine it, it is a war of attrition you have the invader on your country which is usually it's a moral booster for the people defending their own country you'll agree with that one and I can just imagine what's going through the head of every each Ukrainian. The only difference I can see in Ukraine, what we done in Croatia, we will uh, actively try to uh, stop the occupying force um, on the roads because, you know, putting the, the, the gas cylinders, you know, I mean, making the concrete um, barriers, you know, in just name it a few and try to use every possible resource. Another thing is between Ukrainians and us, it is which I'm admiring Ukrainians again. Um, and um, I was, that war I was was 30 years ago, which is a big difference um, um, in technology. But we need to fight. We need to fight enemy to take our weapons from them. And we were very foolish attacking army barracks uh, just, just to grab the weapons. But one thing Ukrainians doing the same as was in Croatia, they have the civilian populations and they're distributing as well uh, the weapons. And every citizen is actually the combatant, become combatant, and they will defend their country to the last. So I really congratulate Ukrainians for resisting the onslaught against very powerful army. And we kind of forget Ukrainians um, they have nowhere to fall back, right? And that's the that's a day uh, that's a day problem, and they have nowhere to go. Croatia was in, in such a 
different situation. One side was Hungary, behind us was Slovenia and Italy. So we can still could, um, you know, get out of the country if we need it. But Ukrainians, they are being continuously attacked by Russia from three axes and plus the sea and plus the air. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very different type of war than we can witness in past 60, 70 years. We've said before on, on in conversations, um, there is a big difference between defending your country versus attacking a country. And we see this in the resistance of the Ukraine nation. Yeah. Um, you know, Russia's a big army, but they're actually struggling. Um, at the moment, it looks, it looks like um, as of the 28th of February 2022. Yes. Look, what, I, what I'm seeing on the internet, like there is no real picture of what's happening over there. As the Russians progressing deeper into country, they're going to face two things as the Federal Yugoslav, uh, Yugoslav People Army faces with us. Resistance will grow, even you don't have the, uh, maybe at the beginning you have the, some type of army units. When I was in Croatia, we had uh, uh, special forces of Ministry of Interior, and the army was just, uh, you know, uh, start creating. But those units become uh, raised very quickly because one thing, one thing Russian underestimate, it's a, it's a people, uh, willingness to fight for the freedom and in no history invader was always had an easy job we had the example that that same ukraine was being invaded by the by the germans 1941-1942 and uh, what's happening now in ukraine it's actually what i'm seeing the map what's happening um the same position the sevastopol as a port you know what i mean and uh Crimea, that's a one sec. And all this region, Ukraine, where you see the uh, the fights now, the Germans during the Operation Foul Blau, Operation Blue, where they try to push towards the River Volga and Oil Rich Caucasus, you know, they fought their way deeper in territory, but eventually in 1943, they've been smashed by the same Ukrainian forces on River Dnipa. And uh, withdrawal was started actually from, from that line, which means both sides know very well terrain and Russians and the uh, Ukrainians, but Ukrainians have advantage because they defend their country. And it's foolish to anybody underestimate the willingness of people to fight because Russians will going to come in a situation as a US people army when they progressing slowly, yes, but there's little by little they're taking territory team and that was a problem that's probably for the ukrainians as well because the front line doesn't become stable it's become very diluted so you have no uh you can't show your position defensive positions because the the line is becoming actually like a ecg you know up and down up and down but that's works as advantage to the defenders for one simple reason russia's are never going to be able to police territory they occupied there's no way they can do it. Secondly, Ukrainians know when to attack, how to attack, and who to attack, even with the smaller arms. And uh, when you occupy the force, there is a third element, which again, if we can see in a Vietnam war, we can see in a, in a Korean war, we can see Second World War. Uh, when the troops are far away from the home, they have nostalgic feeling. And the question is when they're gonna come back. Ukrainians, on the other hand, they are their home. They are at their home. And regardless how much firepower Russians they do have, and they will cause the damage because more damage they, uh, more more casualties they being inflicted by Ukrainians, the uh, severity of their attack is going to be bigger. And they're going to use the different calibers, different weapons, so on. However, as I say, you can't conquer the country like Ukraine. First, it's vastness, distances. There's uh, another thing, it's a logistics I can see on um, across the social media. I mean, today a team I saw that the peasant with the tractor actually steal the armored personal carrier from the Russians because has no no <laughs> petrol. And that's 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 very interesting. And that's the big thing, actually the the the, the, the status of the invading force. Needless to say that 
I have a little bit, little doubts of the sheer size or invading force. We can't call this, uh, which we done, you know, in our world, uh, reconnaissance in, in, in force, which means you send a bigger unit, company, battalion, armored with the sub vehicles to actually not to attack, but to probe the enemy lines. But I think the Russians withholding some reserves, but as well, for the reason, you know, you can't just send entire invading force without understanding what's waiting ahead of you. And so far, Ukrainians show them what are waiting for them. As much as it's hard for Ukrainians, it's going to be harder for the Russians every step they go ahead. They are distant from their bases, they're distant from their logistics, they're distant from their home, and they're deeper in enemy territory, which they are not welcome. So I think that sums some things you ask me. It's very interesting, you know, the uh, civilian taking the armored truck, these <laughs> acts of, of courageousness, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, have, absolutely. Have you heard of the ghost of Kiev? Well, I heard that there's some plane, MiG-29. Um, it's actually shut down by my yesterday viewing on social media 10 uh, enemy airplanes. 10 air enemy airplanes he shot yes. down by himself. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Look, look, like I do remember in our war, and, and I, I'll, I'll tell you how, what enemy doesn't understand, doesn't matter what type of enemy you are, if you don't know what the end game is, once when you occupy territory, you have the civilians who um, will resist. And we have the example in the Second World War, when the Churchill uh, supported every active resistance against the Germans across the Europe and put that 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 um, plane out called the uh, Set Europe Ablaze. Problem it is with the invading force that deeper than in, in, in the territory and they try to control the 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 one country, they are experience something very new. And that's an active and passive resistance of the citizens. Regardless, you know, like I'm not going to that part, you know, what type of uh, uh, support invading force has in domestic population, collaborators, fifth columns and everything else. We knew it as well in our war. We knew that it's a, a same situation with the Russians and Ukrainians experience, because don't forget over 80 years, Russians and Ukrainians, they were shared their culture, they created a family on both sides. They they uh, live under the common goal uh, under, for the same purpose, defending the communism. You know, they work together, they build together across the entire USSR, which then consisted, if I remember correctly, 29 republics. Same was in, in Croatia, you know, like we, we, we suddenly have the war against our neighbors, our friends, our family members. And that's a difficult in, in Russia. People will mistrust to each other and it's going to be a long um, road to prove your um, your allegiance and your loyalty to the country. And of course, the Russians will try to use and influence those um, people who are believe they're more Russians than Ukrainians by living in Ukraine. They'll try to use them to help them to police in a country, which again, that's a very, very small number of people. So it doesn't matter how much it will take, Russians will know their plans, what they want to achieve there, but they're going to have the more casualties when the some type of standby comes in, I mean, some, some agreement, they'll not be able to police this country because people's going to put active and passive resistance as we did. And it doesn't matter how much enemy force they're using and they're becoming in some shape or form, they become very cocky team. That's, that's what I saw. We, we used to be, um, when I saw the columns of the tanks and I remember once you know, there was a, about about 10 or 15 these tanks, you know, T-55, 72, 84. And on the first tank was a commanding officer sitting on a cupola of the tank, right? On a turret was sitting, eating the apple. And, you know, you, 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 you want to shoot him, but you have nothing to do, right? And 
you know how cocky they are you know they were shooting like a like a like a shooting gallery our buildings you know i mean one by one and everything else but things have changed and that enemy becomes more secure and, and more confident in their success the more casualties ukrainians want to inflict to russians so it is not question when but how they're going to inflict these casualties and being the russian soldier in ukraine it is not good at this stage team how are the ukrainian so you've been on you've been on that defending side right now it's about three days into this conflict yes how are you feeling at that stage? And therefore, I guess, similarly, what's going through the minds and the hearts of the of the Ukrainian soldiers looking to defend their country? They're defending not just the country. They defend the family, the kids, the wives, the husbands. They're defending what they love most, the, 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 the ground they're working. We don't talking now about what country was look like before uh, a few days ago. Whatever in Ukraine, political system or unhappiness, happiness, they have enough of this or not enough that they all love their country because that's you defending your country. And perhaps now they are on defensive and they are on defensive, but I have no doubt that it's going to come time for offensive as we did in Croatia. The first major operation uh, for me was a year and a half later, after defending the ground and my country. And that feeling when you start liberating your territory gives you more confidence that you can win and the enemy has a understanding that they can lose. I don't know how long it's going to take. I'm not a military planner in Ukraine. I don't understand them. Russians will experience severe losses in urban combat which i try to always stipulate those who never experience urban combat they should not talk about this i admiring every ukrainians a team i can't explain to you i saw in my eyes for so many months so many years people living in a basement in a mold in cold wet basement for months without knowing what's happening outside and that being said it is gives you energy to defend even more so urban combat is a deadly as much as it's deadly for the attacking force and don't forget one thing we don't talk about Stalingrad people love to compare with the Stalingrad it's Kiev's gonna be Stalingrad had behind them River Volga behind River Volga was the entire interior of the Russia and they poured reserves. City as a Kiev and every military plan will agree. When you have three and a half million people uh, surrounded, they will fight. They will fight and you can fight so much. But eventually, it's a something else what brings you down, which I saw with my own eyes, in my words, I use in my experience. You try to have the normal life in a city, but you can see slowly with the plating from the food, medical supplies transport public doesn't exist hospitals has been overrun with the wounded and dead uh, and everything else people will carry and that's uh, certain that ukrainians will prevail over the russians because three and a half million people in one city it's a little bit too big even for the russians so doesn't matter how much you surround them it's going to be very difficult for the uh for the ukrainians uh, to understand because i said from my experience urban fight it is give advantage to attacking uh to defenders and disadvantage to attacking force however there is a in hindsight don't forget one thing in past 30 years we have so many wars across the globe and the russians spent quite a substantial time obviously to learn how to combat things but regardless of this I believe that Russians, the soon they start seeing how many casualties do they do have. And don't forget one thing, that um, idea that the Russians have the unlimited pool of men, it, it is ridiculous, right? Because in a war, 
there is no true winner in terms of who win, who has more losses, who has a less losses. Ultimate price is a human life. And when you see, as I saw, the people disappearing around you and you defend that, you're seeing things differently. But when you are attacking force, when you start inflicting these this casualties, then you can see it that their morale is actually decreasing. And that's going to happen to Russians. First, they're going to, Ukraine is going to inflict them big casualties. And secondly, there will be the differences in terms of morale. Morale is going to shift. Attackers going to lose morale and the defenders going to gain morale. However, I have the serious, serious doubts that urban fight in any shape or form could be conducted by rules of war. And this is what I was always afraid. My city was surrounded 80% from all sides. We have the one road, one rail track. So we have some combinations of bringing reinforcement, taking civilians out. But I heard this morning on the news, the Klitschko, uh, Klitschko uh, mayor of the Kiev says, we can't evacuate civilians. And that's, uh, that's a problem for the, for the defenders, civilians. And that's what the, it actually gives you morale, both, but as well, it is the problem. So that's my understanding so far. Mm -hmm. So you talk about morale, and that's actually, that's incredibly important. Yeah. Because the Russian soldiers, I'm sure there's some of them that don't want to be there, whereas the Ukrainian soldiers have to be there, and they're there to fight for their country. Whereas I'm sure in the back of some Russian soldiers' minds, they're like, this is, I don't want to be here. You know, um, I'm being told to be here. I'm not willing to be here. And there's going to be a big difference in there, isn't there? What's what's your thoughts on that? Look, first of all, and nobody, what nobody does understand, when the some operation, military operation has been created, everybody um, has on their mind, there's going to be the casualties, acceptable rate of the casualties. I know this because I was being asked many times during the war, you know, what a, prepared as some type of plan. It was ad hoc because it was happening during the <laughs> battle um, for the next follow for the following day, you know. Morale plays the crucial role. It is what is play plays the crucial role. Ukrainians has been supported by entire world while Russians been booed by entire world. Um, Ukrainians defending their country. However, I say something from my experience. There was the moments when I felt I can't do anymore, but then yet next moment, I'll find a reason why to push forward because it's difficult. Because when I saw behind my back, I saw the buildings behind my back, a few hundred meters behind my back, and I knew civilians are there. When you break morale, that's the, that's the greatest victory for the defenders. Uh, there is a historical event, a uh, gentleman called Xenophon, who was, uh, well, in today's terms, we call him Playboy, and he was Socrates' friend. He ventured with a Greek army into Persia. Long story short, they've been betrayed, the command has been executed. 401 or 404 year before Christ. I, I, I need to check this, but it's those between those two years. Anyway, long story short, there was a Greek army decapitated without commanding officers and um, uh, the planners and everything else. And then Xenophon, you know, due to circumstances, stood up and rallied the troops and promised them to return them into the Greece. Now, the morale was non-existent. People lost the willing to fight, but Xenophon galvanized them. And that's what's going to happen in Ukraine. And the president doing a good job. He's always up front, you know, he's always uh, bringing this news uh, to the citizens, what's happening, how's happening. Uh, nothing has been um, withheld. Um, but as I said, Tim, at the beginning, morale started breaking when the body bags start arriving home. And Russia has a tradition with Afghanistan, as you know, 10 years war in Afghanistan. Uh, body bags was coming on daily basis. And this is the point when the invading army understand it's time to to solidify their victories and stay where they are put, or they try to find some diplomatic solution to withdraw from this one. 
in our case, when I was in 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 in, in, a, uh, in our war for democracy, we didn't have nobody to help us from foreign countries. So we done the best what we can and how we can, but we knew that we need to liberate our country and stop on the borders. Ukraine is gonna come victorious from this, and the morale is gonna grow hour by hour, and resistance is gonna grow hour by hour particularly that resistance behind enemy lines. Because as I said before, it's very hard to policing for the Russians and they were gonna feel very insecure. And of course you had this nostalgic feeling, you're missing your wife, your kids, your mom, your dad, your workplace. So if we, you know, Russian army is a huge army and uh, Russian army is not um, designed to be had a mobile warfare as you know the Western countries they have, but as well, you must understand the Russians. Um, it will find a way to grind till morale is not broken, and Ukrainians gonna stop the grinding and break their morale. It's just a question of the time and how much casualties gonna happen on both sides. I guess the question that the the Western world wants to know is: Will this catapult into into World War Three? Now, there's a lot of a, lo- a lot of opinion a lot of opinions going on, but I guess to to also give this some context as well, the similar war that you were in. I was reading your book, Blood Soaked Soil. The foreword yes. is r- written by Nick Hill, yes. and Nick Hill said that when you were in the battlefield. In use in in your world, um, Nick was sitting in a university lecture hall. Yes, you know, you were the similar age, and two very different things. So that's, I guess, a bit of context as to you know, it's it's possible for a war to go on, and then in the Western world, um, Nick sit in a, in a lecture hall. Yes. What, what's your opinion? <laughs> I guess going back to that question, then <laughs> will this catapult into World War Three? What, what do you look? What do you think? There's a difference. Thirty years is a difference. Thirty years ago, I didn't even know what the internet it is. To be honest with you, and we still read the newspapers and watching TV. Um, you know, that was a different times. You know, it was a different times than today. However, uh, we. we, we in hindsight of all these events, it's like there's a lot of politicians, there's a lot of military planners, the strategies, then net whatever they is. Everybody seems to me is an expert till things doesn't start changing the form and shape of this war. Will be the Third World War? I, I doubt. Can I envisage some larger conflict? Yes, but only under one under one circumstance. That is in a case that Russians being um, any interference from outside against the Russia territory that will result a trigger uh, the conflict absolutely you know I think that Russia doesn't want you know he cannot he can't wage the war you know they can't wage the war of attrition for the five years but as as well we must forget that sometimes events doesn't go as we plan and we believe can can do it um and as like everybody in the war try to portray themselves always a victor always a victim same time and you know but the true casualty it's a people uh on the ground and they know the situation will trigger t- third world war i doubt will that possibly trigger uh some larger conflict yes because um Traditionally, and we are talking about times of the Stalin and, um, you know, when he died in 1953, you must remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. For those who don't know, they can Google Cuban Missile Crisis when the Khrushchev and Kennedy had a standoff against each other. When the Russians tried to park the nuclear warheads on a Cuba, five minutes flight to Washington, and that almost triggered the Third World War. Now, those time passed by. But I think that everybody's on their mind, they know nuclear weapon, it's not just a last resort. Nobody wants to use that one. 
doesn't matter how much tactical warhead it is or what's the yield and what can do. But in case that Russia has been in position that's been somebody have the interference from outside wall and try to smash some of the targets within Russia, I think that will trigger totally different series of events. Uh, because uh, that's going to be an uh, attack against the uh, Russians itself. And the perception then is going to be changed in Russia as well. And we saw this as well in, in, in war in Croatia. The moment the civilians being 1995, our capital city has been bombed by the multiple rocket launchers uh, mercilessly, out of the blue team, out of the blue. And uh, by that stage, nobody touched the capital city because they knew it when, you know, that's a place where they, you know, not just the political, economical life it is, but there was a shelter for many refugees and some normal type of life. And that triggered totally different um, mood in us before we have the waged war for democracy, freedom. But suddenly people uh, saw the war differently. Um, and that changed drastically everybody's mind. But that's again, I say, this is all based on my experience. And as I said, like, I can understand, I know what they're going people through in Ukraine. I've been there, done that, not that scale, no, not against that army. But similarities are uh, literally identical, right? Identical. You're fighting the planes, you have no, you know, uh, anti-aircraft guns. You're fighting, there's so many tanks, you know what I mean? But I truly believe that sooner or later, event will escalate only if Russia has been attacked from outside. And we're not talking about nothing uh, big like a nuclear weapon, but any com any commercial weapons uh, will trigger Russian response very, very violently. And that could put everybody on a path of uh, mutual destruction. And, you know, I mean, that's, I, you know, again, I don't like to see that one. I think... um. So I've got two last questions. Um, Please. This is, this is going to be a, a part one of part two um, yes. and free podcast. But I'd love for you to even just look down the barrel of the camera here and what do you want the Ukrainian citizens, the Ukrainian soldiers, what would you tell, what do you want to tell them, them right now, uh, people of Ukraine, knowing your experience and what you've been through? Don't stop fighting for your freedom. Don't stop. It's hard. It's difficult. I saw with my own eyes buildings being destroyed, roads, you know, hospitals, people dying, children being injured. But I truly believe that you will win and prevail because you're defending your country. And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be dark moments, but you're not alone. The world is with you as best we can. And I truly believe it doesn't matter how Russia portray themselves, you're stronger than they, than they are military arm. And there's going to be the moments when you're going to doubt yourself, you will try to stop. Don't. I know you will not. Don't ever think, even when you think there's no solution, there's always going to be a solution. Every day you're fighting, every day you're breathing, it's a day less of day strength. You're taking them strength with every day resisting. And that every strength has the limits. You picking up your strength, they're losing the strength. It's hard, it's difficult. And I wish that never happened, but I truly believe stay on your course, stay on your path, and you're going to prevail. You already did, but it's going to take a little bit longer. Thank you, Mario. Thank you for coming back on the Experts Blueprint. Thank um, you. If somebody wants to reach out to you, talk to you, message you, find out more about your story. Um, mm -hmm. Where do we go? Feel free to contact me on mariobeckers.com.au. And the one thing, Tim, I forgot to say this before. Don't forget one thing. Your enemy, believe he knows you, but you are evolving every day. You are evolving by improvising, by adjusting your defense, and he has one tactics believing it's going to be successful and if somebody likes to talk to me more about this happy to talk mariobeckes.com.au mario awesome 
I've been Tim, you've been Mario, we've been talking. Thank you for being the expert that shared your blueprint today. Thank you, Tim.